So let's go back to the, the, the person who shows up. So you've, you've excluded other things. You've diagnosed them with indeed plantar fasciitis. What are the most typical reasons for that presentation in, um, let's start within a young person, a young active person. Weakness to the foot for certain. And when you say weakness, specifically within which muscles, which, which are the prime examples of the muscular sure that- So when they come in, I'll always, I have a toe dynamometer. So it's this little device. Did you bring it today? I did. Okay, good. I've I, always wanted to try one of these. Yes. Um, I'm embarrassed to find out where I stack up, <laughs> but we'll see. It tests the strength of your toes. So it's a little device. You put a, like a card underneath your big toe. And I'll have the patient press the, their big toe into the card. Yep. Um, you should be able to produce 10% of your body weight through your big toe. Okay. That's flexor halysis longus. When you put the card underneath two through five, you should be able to produce about seven to eight percent of your body weight. When they're pressing their toes down, there's a couple rules. They can't lift up their heel and they can't hammer the toes. Remember we talked yes. about that hammering? Yep. That's when you'll see people who love to hammer their toes because it's a compensation for weakness in the foot. So that's how they walk. It's like I'm clawing my way forward. Mm. So when they do that, they have to press their toes down. When they, when you do the big toe, mm -hmm. the extensor halysis longus, are the, are two, are toes two through five, do they need to be off the ground or are they on the ground? Just not hammered on the, on the ground, on the ground, not, ground, not hammered. hammered, but you're pressing down 10% of body weight. I mean, these see, I love, you know, you know me, Courtney, yeah. I <laughs> love metrics, right? Cause what gets measured gets yes. managed. Um, <clears throat> Is this something anybody can go out and do, or do you have to, I mean, you can buy these dynamo dynamo oh, dynamo yeah. yeah, you can buy them. I think the other thing that's also easy to measure for if someone's going to do it at home is I have a little um, laser scanning device. I also brought this today where you would stand um, close to a wall and you'd measure from your umbilicus to the wall. Then you keep your body straight all right, so your hips and shoulders are straight and you lean into the wall as far as you can. It's your toe strength that stops you from smacking your face into the wall. Mm. That distance should be 4.5 inches or more. Got it. So in other words, you, we could do the trigonometry on that, but basically there's an angle at which you're creating a moment arm that you, ne you need to be able to resist. Correct. It's called the anterior fall envelope. <laughs> Cool. We'll test all these on you today. Oh boy. <laughs> but it's really fascinating, right? Because those are toe weakness, by the way, is the single biggest predictor of falls when we age. Really? So this is really cool. Most, um, when you think about falling, it typically occurs, we're jumping all over the place, by the way, here, <laughs> um, at the initiation of gait. So if I don't have that anterior fall envelope, if my toes are weak, I'm going to keep going. And so not only can toe weakness be a predictor of things like plantar fasciitis, fasciosis, but also toe weakness can be, it, it, and it is, researched by Karen Merkel, a, one of the single best predictors of falling, which is, I mean, massive. Yeah. I mean, I think we should spend a few minutes on that in a moment because mm -hmm. obviously we, people who listen to this podcast are no strangers to the importance of fall prevention. We have talked about it typically through the lens of bone density and muscle mass. So low bone density, low muscle mass lead to more catastrophic outcomes during falls. Obviously the muscle mass is also a great way to help prevent falling, but this yeah. is a very specific muscle mass. Mm -hmm. Um, so athletic person shows up or active person shows up, you've diagnosed the problem, you have a culpable reason for it in weakness. You've already alluded to the fact which says, look, I'm probably not going to rest you. Mm -hmm. What drives you towards 
temporary orthotic versus no orthotic and just get right to work. So when I've had plantar fasciitis, we've never done an orthotic. I've probably had two bouts of it in my life. It's just been at work, uh, a, bi a bit of backing off some of the volume, mm -hmm. some manual therapy, ice, and more footwork. What's your typical strategy? I think it's very individual specific. Mm. I think you have, you definitely have to meet the patient where they are. What is their activity level? What are they willing to do? Um, what age are they? Are they going to do this stuff? Um, from a passive perspective, um, I do like shockwave mm -hmm. into the bottom of the foot. Um, medial gastroc. Um, the way the medial gastroc inserts into the Achilles tendon. So we talked about the gastroc. There's two muscle bellies. The medial gastroc sits on the inside. And how it attaches into the Achilles tendon is one of the, um, will prevent ankle dorsiflexion. Tell people what dorsiflexion is. So ankle dorsiflexion is basically this motion. When mm -hmm. I am walking. Yeah, am pulling I, the toes back, basically. Pull, yes. Pulling the foot back. Yes. Yeah. And plantar um, flexion just for... <laughs> point the toes. The other way, yep. Point the toes, extend the foot. Yep. Um, that ankle dorsiflexion, in a walking gait cycle, we need about 10 to 15 degrees. You'd be surprised how people like to cheat the system there. So when we get to medial gastroc, we look and see how is their ankle mobility? Is it something I need to address? Mm. How is their foot strength? Is it something I need to address? And then how is their capacity? You know, when we are looking at, um, I always say it's never just a foot problem. You know, I wish it was It'd make it easier for me anyway. But when I'm watching someone walk, remember it's all walking is this, um, internal rotation when our foot hits the ground. So I don't want the plantar fascia to be down there like a dish rag. So not only am I assessing what's happening at the foot, but I'm looking at the knee, I'm looking at the hip, who's driving the car. How well can my glute max, for example, control the rotation, control my pronation so that, you know, is that having an effect on the structures of the foot? So when I look at those cases, especially with chronic heel pain, it's never just a foot thing. I have to carry it up into the rest of the and chain. And as you've sort of alluded to, the plantar fascia, because it's so long, you can really have that pain in many different places, right? I mean, the, the, the real estate on the bottom of the foot that is susceptible to inflammation or irritation of the plantar fascia is pretty long. Is it typically more posterior and close to the heel? Most of the fibers that were more commonly, you know, irritated is that medial, you know, there's a different branches of it, if you will. So most patients will get that pain kind of at the heel, maybe yep. more on the inside of the heel. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be pretty classic where, you know, it's, it's really painful in the morning. And then as they walk on it, it gets better. Um, that can change its, its face a little bit, um, depending upon how chronic it gets. Wow. So it's a lot more complicated, but I mean, it, it seems to me that all roads keep pointing back to this, the, the plantar fasciitis is a canary in the coal mine that your feet are weak. Yes. And, you know, that tie bar mechanism that we spoke of, mm. that free mechanism of the vertical and horizontal stability that we have at the foot, take advantage of that. You know, allow the, the foot and the toes to splay and do a couple foot strengthening exercises. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to be difficult. Mm -hmm.